Alrighty, welcome back to Operating Systems. So today is a fun lecture, fairly chill. We're gonna run a bank today and make it go fast. So, uh, yeah. Uh, is the, is the current lab due on Sunday? Yeah, Friday. current lab's due on Sunday, right? The fifth? The fifth, it should be. Yep, it's Sunday. Sunday right? Thank you. Yeah, which, I mean, most people have not shown up today because of midterm, so, well, at least we'll be doing it. So, all right, today, fun, we're running a bank. Our bank is doing 10 million transfers just to simulate doing something. We can create a varying number of accounts. So that is a command line argument we have, how many accounts we are managing. The rules are each account will have its own unique identifier and its own balance. And every account will start with $1,000. We're going to generate 10 million transfers between random accounts where they will transfer 10% of their current balance to another account. So in this case, if we are the bank, they're just transferring money between themselves. We should not be losing money. So the other little thing here is there's this function called securely connect the bank. Before you start any transfer, you need to call that first. And that's to simulate, you know, connecting to the bank's mainframe or their database or whatever to simulate the transfer. So the rest of the day, coding example, all our goal is is to make it go fast. So let us switch to it and see what it does. So here we go. There's a few defines. There's one defined for the starting balance. It's again, $1,000. The number of transfers we're going to generate, which is 10 million, we're probably going to want, if we want to make this go fast, we're going to want threads. So I just define num threads equal to the amount of cores I have on my machine, just in case we want to use them as eight. Then here, this is the struct that represents an account. So it has an ID, which will be unique, and then a balance. Then I have the number of accounts I set to zero, and then an array for all the accounts that I set to null because I'm going to allocate this based off the command line argument. So next is the securely connect the bank function. It does some nonsense right now where it just wastes some time. Ideally, this would actually connect to a server or something like that. It's just a placeholder so we have something else to argue about. So we will skip over that. Look at the transfer function. So we are transferring between two accounts. So the first will be by a pointer. So a account that will be used as the from and then account that will be used as a to. So for the transfer, we will securely connect to the bank, then calculate the amount we need to transfer. So we're taking 10% of the from balance, which is the same as just dividing by 10. So that's 10%. That is the amount. And then we are subtracting it from the from accounts balance and then adding it to the to balance. So this should be from the point of view as the bank, just zero sum. We're just moving money between accounts. If we have a great bank, we shouldn't be losing any money, right? Should be the same before and after. The only thing is the customer's accounts might be different, but we're a big bank. We don't care about our customers. We just care about our bottom line. <laughs> so we have a check error function. So all the pthread functions, just in case we want to check errors, a zero from them being successful, and then non-zero means it was not successful, so it can print an error message. That's just a little helper function. In our main, we check that we have two command line arguments, first being the name of the program, then the other would be the number of accounts to create. If we don't have two, we exit, we set locale, just so we can get some commas whenever we use printf, Generally, you don't have to care about this, but this is just so we have commas, so it's easier to read. Then we calculate the number, or we get the number of accounts by converting the string to a number, checking for errors, all that fun stuff. After that, we can see how many bytes our accounts will use. So it will, each account will be the number of bytes to represent an account. And then the total number of bytes for our array is just that number multiplied by how many accounts we need to have. So we calculate that, we malloc it, we check if it's not null to make sure we're not out of memory. We'll print how many megabytes we use here. And then after that, we'll just initialize them, 
make sure they all have a unique ID, and then they all start with $1,000. And then initially, we'll just print off how much funds, like all of the funds our bank is managing. So it should be the starting balance times the number of accounts. So that's how much money we're managing. So that's all commented out, so I don't have to type it later. This is the thing we need to make faster. So this is simulating the 10 million transfers. So right now, four zero up to 10 million. So this it will execute 10 million times. We randomly pick a from index to pick an account. Then we randomly pick a to index and then we initiate the transfer. So we figure out what account that index represents. Then we initiate the transfer. So after that, we're just going to calculate the total amount of money our bank has because it should be the same before and after. So we, we initialize the total balance to zero, iterate over every single account and just keep on summing up that balance. And ideally, the final funds of the bank is going to be equal to our initial funds. So we're not losing any money. So since as we've written it right now, we don't use any threads or anything. We just have the one main thread. We don't have any problems we were talking about before. Everything should work properly. So if we compile that, let's say, let's time it because our goal today is to run faster. So let's just have a thousand accounts, which means we are managing a million dollars and we'll see how long this takes to do 10 million transfers. So we're waiting, we're waiting. We're waiting, we're waiting. So it took 10.6 seconds. So our amount before and after are the same. That's good. Now our goal today is to make it go faster. So if I want to make it go faster, well, I could make a new process for each one and then share memory between them. But most of this is just by default, like we're just sharing a bunch of memory anyway. So we should probably use threads. So here is the loop we are trying to parallelize. So we are going to create, I will uncomment this. So we want to make eight threads to make our bank go faster. So here I create num threads, p threads, and then create them in this loop. So here I'm going to pass a thread ID to each thread so that they are all have a unique thread ID. So because I want to share data between threads or I want to pass things, well, I have to allocate some space on the heap and then give it each thread a pointer to that so then it can use it because we can only pass a pointer as part of our run function. So here I malloc an int. I assume I have some memory. Then I write a value to it. And then I create a new thread that wants to execute this run function. And after I create all my threads, I just wait for them all to finish. And then I would check the final balance of my bank. So in the run function, well, it takes the pointer argument, casts it back to the type we know we pass to it. So it's a pointer to an int. We dereference it. We reload that value or read it into a local variable. So now we don't need to use that heap memory anymore, so we can just free it. We saw this before to pass arguments to the thread, so we can free it, and then each of our thread will run here. So the code we were trying to parallelize again was all of this transfer. So if I want to make it go fast, well, I just do this. I just do the old copy-paste, move it in each thread. So is this fast? Probably. So will there be data races? That's a good question. Will this also be slow? So let's just see. So let's compile and run it with the single thread, with just the main thread, just what we had before. It was 10.6 seconds. In this case, We're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. This isn't looking good for speeding things up. Is there any deadlock? 
Is there any deadlocks? That's a good question. Well, let's see. Well, let's argue about deadlocks. Would there be any deadlocks here? So deadlocks are between mutexes. Currently, we have nothing. There aren't any locks to begin with. Yeah, there aren't any locks. So how can we have a deadlock if we have no locks? So this is still going. So we can check HTOP and see what my processor is doing. We can see it's doing some work. So each of those bar charts is like the CPU usage of, of each of my cores. It was doing stuff, and now it's not doing anything, which means it probably finished. So this took a minute and two seconds, way slower. Why would that be way slower? And also, we're wrong here, so that's not good. So how many transfers are we doing in total in this case? So num transfers, remember, was that 10 million. So if I have eight threads, what is my first issue here? Yeah, I'm doing 80 million transfers. So if I want to do the 10 million faster, well, the idea is I just divide it up equally between each thread and have each thread do 1,250,000. In this case, I have each thread doing all of the transfers, so they're doing a total of 80 million. So my first problem is I'm doing way more work now than I did before. So if I want to make sure that each thread is only doing an eighth of the work, I should do something like that. So I make sure that each of the threads is only doing an eighth of the work. Yeah. Yeah, so I could instead increment th this instead of by one, increment it by num threads. In this case, it's a nice divisible number, so it doesn't matter. And doing one more transfer is going to be like very fast, so it doesn't really matter. But yeah, you're right. If you really cared about dividing it up super equally, if there was an indivisible number, then I should do something like that. In this case, I will not worry about it. So now I run it. I have eight threads each doing an eighth of the work. Hey, it's a bit faster than one. But uh, yeah, our total bank funds are not correct. So that's not good. Well, let's pretend we are Scotiabank or TD Bank or something like that. We have a lot of customers. So let's say we're managing, what's that, $10 billion? We're using 152 megabytes of memory just for the account. That's a lot of memory. We run this. Same before and after. Hmm. Why would that be? You are getting lucky. Yeah. Yeah, now a data race is super unlikely because our data races are changing an account's balance. So if two accounts are, or two threads are changing the same account's balance at the same time, then we might have a data race. If we have up to like, what's this, a million? No, 10 million. So if we have 10 million accounts and only eight threads, the likelihood of two threads essentially showing a data race is quite low. So at this point, I'm too big to fail. So I'm good. So unlike most problems in computing, when it gets bigger, it typically gets more difficult. For data races, it's the opposite. So the bigger, the more complicated I'm doing, well, maybe the less likely I am to have a data race. What well, about if I do something like that? Seven accounts. Likely, that should be more likely for the data race. So I start with $7,000 and I end with. Yeah, I end with 95 billion. So imagine you are operating a bank that only has a sum of $7,000 and then at the end of the day, it says you owe 95 billion. <laughs> yeah, this is a bank error in your favor. What likely happened here? Yeah, so there was a data race, there was an overflow, or in this case, specifically, it was an underflow. So the balance was a U int, so it's an unsigned. So what happened is when we subtracted, 
it was too much, it went negative, but because it can't represent a negative value, it over or under flows and goes to the maximum size, which is gigantic. So at the end of the day, you know, our bank is super wrong and that's not great. If we have three, we're also more likely to have a data race, but also less likely to underflow. So in this case, we're at, end up with $27. So also not a good situation. <laughs> yeah, so now we're yeah, at your bank balance, which isn't that great. So assuming we want to fix it, how would we fix this so we don't have a data race? Yeah, yeah, have a lock. Let's just make a lock. So I can just create a good old lock, static, you said mutex. So here's my lock. This code, actually, before even doing that, <clears throat> actually, if we can leave that. So before even dealing with the lock, we have to argue about another thing. So this run function is running from multiple threads. And we call this ran function, which we did not write. So we should probably check if it was even safe safe to call it with multiple threads at a given time. So if we look at the documentation for, whoops, not read. If we look at the documentation for RAND, we can pull it up. And if we go down, we can see some attributes. And there is this fun attribute table where they have an attribute called thread safety. So if the value is MT safe, it means multi-threading safe. So we're actually safe to use this across multiple threads. We don't have any data races or anything like that. But you might imagine that RAND has some internal state. So it might be using a mutex between all of our functions, which may not be good. So if we wanted to, there is a version of RAND called RAND R. And it lets you manage your own state so that you can have completely independent state and there'll be no interaction between multiple threads. And it wouldn't need a mutex because, well, it's supposed to modify your own state. So here, its state is just a number. I can initialize it to, I don't know, the thread ID plus one, and then give that seed to both functions. So in that case, I have all my state. Hopefully these rand r functions are completely independent so they wouldn't need a lock or anything. So this, just changing the function I'm using to be faster and more independent, hopefully we'll get some type of speed up. So if I run it now, it went from seven to just 1.7. So it got a lot faster just by knowing that, well, if we use RAND and it's thread safe, it probably has a mutex in it, which probably makes it a lot really slow if we have multiple threads all calling it at the same time. So we can use RAND R, make it a lot faster. But in this case, we still have our data race. So we just failed faster, which, eh, not always a bad thing. All right, so we create a mutex. Where should I place my lock and unlock to make this completely safe? before and after the for loop. So in the run, the seed, it's a local variable, so it's independent. This loop, those are all independent variables. Those are all independent for thread, so we have no, these are all independent, so we don't have any data races. In transfer, okay, we're sharing the accounts between threads, so this is probably where we have data races. So, well, we could do the Java thing, right? It's safe if we just put a lock and an unlock around the entire function. So let's do that. So does this have a data race now? Let's see. Let's see. It's just because you run it and you don't see, remember a big bank? We had a data race, but we were too big to fail. So just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's safe. So 
if we look at this, well, only one thread can do this at a time. We're sharing the accounts, so I shouldn't have a data race. I don't have any concurrent accesses. I only modify the accounts in one go. So hopefully when I run this, I don't have any data races, so I should have the same balance before and after. So I have a million dollars. Seems a lot slower, because before it was only one second. And remember, our baseline without using threads or anything was 10.6. In this case, ooh, 18.3. But hey, it looks like we don't have a data race, and in fact, well, we don't because this whole thing happens. So, can I make this any faster? Because right now I'm doing a very poor job. I have eight threads and now it's twice as slow. So even moving this lock, can I move it and hopefully make it go faster? Because remember, we're limited by this critical section because only one thread can do it at a time. So we just turn the whole thing serial. Can we make it include just these two lines of uh, subtraction and addition? So you want this? Yeah. So in this case, we. Oh, that was better. So in this case, we would still have a data race because well, we're not protecting this read, so the read's still included in the data race. So, but what about if we do this? Is this safe? So ideally, this securely connect to bank function is independent for each thread, in which case we don't need a mutex, right? If we want things to go faster, we want our critical section to be as small as possible. So we should be able to take this securely connect the bank out of it. So let's run it again. Hopefully it, will be, it should be a lot faster because we made our critical section a bunch smaller. So now we're at 5.9. So Ideally, it goes eight times faster, but now instead of being slower, we're two times faster, so that's not so bad. At this point, this is about the best I can do with a single lock. So what should I do to make it go even faster? So for example, if you want things to go faster, you want as many things to go in parallel as possible. So if I am transferring between accounts, could I transfer between you two guys and then you two guys at the same time? Sorry? So I can run to and from between threads as long as they're all different. So there's no way right now without using a mutex or anything that I can check what other threads are doing at any given time. So I need a mutex. Yeah, that's an idea. One mutex per account. Seem terribly large mutex. That's not too bad. Let's let's try. So, here, we'll just add a field to the account called mutex. So now each account will get its own individual mutex. Of course, we're going to have to initialize it. So let's go down. So here we have to call pthread, whoops, not mintex, mutex init, accounts i dot mutex, then null, so default attributes. So now every account has a mutex. So what should my transfer look like now? Both lock from N2, so do something like that. I can't switch between those two locks? Ooh, I deadlocked. So yeah, can this deadlock as I have written it? I have to switch them? No? Well, there is a possibility. Yeah. What is that possibility of deadlocking? 
two threads try and transfer in the reverse yeah, thread. So if I have transfer, uh, I don't know, ID, ID one to ID two, whoops. And then also I have a transfer of, whoops, transfer of ID two to ID one. And then th this is in thread one, this is in thread two. So what may happen is thread two or thread one executes first. Well, it would get this lock first and then we could context switch over to thread two. And to argue about deadlocks and everything, just assume you have only one physical core and you're just context switching around. So in this case, I would context switch to thread two. It would acquire mutex two, and now we're at the deadlock condition. So we're at hold and wait. Thread two has lock two. Thread one has lock one, and they're each waiting for each other. So how would I resolve this? Are they in the same order? So if they were in the same order, if I have transfer ID one and two, I should always acquire them ID one and then ID two. Yeah. Yeah, smallest ID first. So each ID is unique for each lock. In this case, I want to make sure I always acquire, I don't know, the lowest ID first. Doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. I could pick the highest ID first. So you said lowest ID first, right? So in that case, well, let's create a pointer to a mutex. So we're going to lock this one first and lock this one second. So in this case, we always want M1 to be the lowest ID and M2 to be the highest ID. So I can just check, their, their IDs are supposed to be unique. So if the from ID is less than the to ID, well then M1 should probably be the from mutex and M2 should be the to mutex. Why is this complaining? Yeah, whatever, don't care. It, yeah, so the other case is, well, if the two ID is smaller than the from ID, then I should acquire the two ID first. So just do the old copy paste to Rooney and change these around. So now I always acquire the lowest ID first. Do I have a deadlock now? Shouldn't, right? Let's see how clever we are. What? So after about 10, we know we have an issue. Uh, it's an issue now. Well, you gave up on it at seven? Okay, now, now we're concerned. All right, so one way we can check, so it might be like we could just be trying really hard, right? So we can check HTOP, see what our CPU is doing. If we look at it, all of our cores are doing not a thing. So yeah, we probably deadlocked. Not good, so this isn't making any progress. Yeah. So this error is very subtle. So I do acquire my locks in the same order every time, which is good, but there is a very subtle case where I can deadlock with just one thread. Because I do something a bit silly. So here's a... Yeah, so what if... Well, if they're both the same. That yeah? We're generating random numbers. So we can think about this a bit harder. So in this context, if we're transferring to and from the same account, 
Yeah, we could just return immediately. We don't have to argue about, oh, okay, they're the same, so we just only need to lock once or something. In this case, transferring to and from the same account, that does nothing, so why even bother? So we'll just do nothing. So if from equals to, then whatever, just return. So now is there a deadlock? Well, hopefully not. We acquire everything in the same order, so that breaks the circular weight. And well, we're not accidentally deadlocking ourselves by trying to acquire the same mutex twice. So let's run this, see how we do. Boom. Almost eight times as fast. Yeah, which is good. So we're actually using all eight cores. We can even see this is fairly satisfying. Let's see how fast I can go. Wait, I didn't hit. Boom, see, go, ramps up and finishes. Isn't that satisfying? Our machine is being used to its full capacity. So, am I done? Probably. It's eight cores, almost eight times as fast. I can't get any better than that. What about if I do something like this? Will that be eight times as fast? It should, yeah, should be. Let's run it. Ooh. Ooh, that was slow. Don't have any data races, but slow. Why? That five is the total amount of... The number of accounts. What? Oh. So there's only five accounts. Yeah, there'll be more locks. And there's less locks. There's only five locks. There's one per account. Yeah, so yeah. there's more contention, right? Yeah. So we're fighting over the locks, and well, there's less things we can do in parallel, so the slower we go. So if we have, well, in this case, if we have like three accounts, well, in actuality, it'll probably be slightly faster, which seems a bit wrong. But in this case, turns out that well, if we only have three accounts, the likelihood of transferring to the exact same account is pretty high. In that case, we do nothing. So it goes a bit faster. In general, if we didn't have that little optimization, it would be a lot slower. But in that case, in this case, well, we just abort it if it's the same account. We have like some weird trade-off here where it's more likely we just do nothing. So successfully create a good bank. So. If I wanted to, is this the only way I could have prevented a deadlock? Well, let's say you don't have an ID anymore. <laughs> you could compare the pointers, yes. Let's say you are scared of pointers. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, we do the try lock so we eliminate the hold and wait thing, right? So let's rewrite this again so we can lock the from mutex. And then we can have while, then we can try to lock the two mutex. So remember, this try lock is a, oops, is a non-blocking version of the lock call and it will tell you whether or not you have acquired the lock. So if try lock returns zero, it means successful. It means you have this two mutex. If it returns anything other than zero, it means you don't have it. So if I don't have it, in the I go into this while loop, what should I do? Sorry? Yield? So I could yield, sure. So if you were doing lab four, you would do like what yield or whatever? Well, the, the system call yield is called sketch yield. So here we go. 
So here, let me delete the other code we have and restore this to its former glory. All right, so that's all we need? Yeah, we need to unlock from. So we should probably do that before the yield, right? Because we want to yield while we're holding no locks. So in this case, I would unlock. Which lock am I unlocking? From. All right, is this good? All right, well, we can try it. Uh, let's do our old, let's do 100. Oops. Yeah, so right here at this line, we need both locks to be safe from a data race, right? So is there a scenario where I reach this line without both locks? Yeah, I'm pretty much guaranteed to. So here I lock the from mutex. So if I pass by this, if I make it past this function call, I have the from mutex. Here I try and get the two. If I go into the body of the while, it means I did not successfully get the two. Then I unlock from. So at this yield, I currently hold no locks. And then in this case, well, I just try and get the two mutex, and if I acquire the two mutex, I follow the loop, and then I'm executing this line with only the two mutex acquired. I don't have the from. So I should probably try and reacquire the from, right? So where would I do that? So here? All right, give it a try. So that means we will certainly uh, Oops. We deadlocked ourselves. Oops. So generally, trying something is not a good way. We should argue about it. So in this case, well, what could happen is we make it through this while loop. So at here, we would have the two mutex. And now we're trying to acquire from. So now we have that hold and wait again. So we're trying to acquire a mutex while we have another one. So that's why we deadlock there. So I should probably put my lock here, right, after I yield. So I reacquire from, and then I, while I have from, I try to acquire two again. So I just retry again. And then if I don't get it, I unlock and I yield, no harm, no foul. So do I have a deadlock anymore? Hopefully not. So here is solution number two. In this case, no, de no deadlock, about the same performance. So it doesn't matter which one we, we use. All right, so any questions about this? We have successfully ran the greatest bank in the world. All right, so I will show you a little tool. It does not excuse you from not arguing about things, but it will make your life a little easier. So just like Valgren kind of helps you detect if you screwed up memory issues, there's this fancy tool that helps you detect if you have screwed up your threads. So if you want to use it, it is called the sanitizer tools and they are fantastic. So there is one tool called Thread Sanitizer. So if you want to reset up your entire build repository such that you compile your code with the sanitizer in it, this is how you do it. So you redo the setup command 
and you give this flag that says use the thread sanitizer when you build. This wipe will just reinitialize everything. So after this, we'll see user defined options, sanitize thread. So now if we compile our code, it now has that thread sanitizer built in it, which will instrument our code and tell us if we have any errors. The caveat between this for this is it will make your program way slower because it's adding a bunch of checks for you. Also, another caveat is if it doesn't show you any errors, that doesn't mean you are 100% safe. So if it shows you an error, it is 100% probability you have that error, but it's just monitoring whatever your program does during that execution. So even if you have a data race, it might not present itself because it might be super unlucky. So just because this tool is clean does not mean you do not have a data race, it just means you might have a rare data race. But if it says you have a problem, you definitely have a problem. So let's uncomment that line because we caused a deadlock here. So if we compile our tool, or if we compile our code again with thread sanitizer, hopefully it helps us out. So if we run our bank sim again, it should be really angry. And it's really angry. It gives us a bunch of output. And what's it say? Well, here, let's go. So it says, gives us a bunch of information about the threads. And it also says mutex M0 acquired while holding M1. Then it says M1 acquired while holding M0. Sounds like a hold and wait to me. And it says, oh, here's your lock order inversion. So it shows you the cyclical dependency, that cir circular dependency of locks. So a thread has M0 trying to get M1, while another thread has M1 trying to get M0. So it shows you that circular, transfer, that circular deadlock, shows you a whole bunch of cases where that's true. So we definitely have a deadlock in this case. So helpful little tool. If we really screwed it up, we can see that our deadlocks can get really complicated. So let us rewind a little bit. So if we rewind to this where we just had a lock, two calls to lock and we didn't even try anything else. Well, we have a lot of output and it also shows that <laughs> our cycles are gigantic. So M0 depends on M1, da 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 da, and this is a series of 10 locks that make it all the way back to the first one. So some deadlocks are more deadlocky than others. This is pretty much takes every thread out with this gigantic cycle. So it will show you, and it is really slow. So here, let's rewind even further. So this is where we had a data race, right? Well. Let's see what this tool tells us about that. So we compile, we run it, and it yells at us. So it yells at us and it says, oh, there's a potential data race. That's very helpful of you. It also tells you what line number it happens. So in line 58, that's the two. So it's telling us, well, it has something to do with this balance. So the balance is shared between different threads. That's pointing us, giving us some helpful tips of where a data race is. If we look up a bit more, gives us some more information. Data race also tells us there's a data race on line 57, which is this line here. So it tells us both of these lines have data races in them. So it gives you some more, I guess, guidance to actually solve your problem. So any questions about all this fun stuff? So this thread sanitizer tool, A++ would use again, yeah. Uh, sure. It's kind of new, and I'm not sure, like, I have to everything all at once. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, yeah, so I'll probably put it in the lab five description because you're going to be using mutexes, and it's there as well, and you guys went to this lecture, so you know to go look at it. Sure. But I'll also include in the lab five one because lab five, well, th th this was essentially lab five but you're doing hash tables instead of accounts.
but same principle. So you'll have to argue about, but yeah, this lecture is basically lab five. So what's that? 54 minutes. So you should be able to finish it in 54 minutes. Probably not. <laughs> All right. Any other questions before we leave for today? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. So let's back up until we don't have an issue. So this was not good. So this code worked, right? Let's get rid of the sanitizer. So let's make sure it's time. Okay, so this was a good version of our code, right? So you're asking, what if we have more threads? So say, I don't know, 16. So 16, in this case, same thing. So I'm limited by the amount of things I can do in parallel. This is technically a little slower because there's a bit of overhead context switching between the different threads, but I'm only transferring between two. If instead, I don't know, 1,000 threads, well, likely that'll just waste a bit more time because I'm context switching between a bunch of threads. So if I run that now, it's a bit slower. So my speed up's limited by the amount of things I can do in parallel. So if one of those, so it might speed up if I can't run all those threads in parallel at once. If one's waiting on like a file or something, and I could run another one, my program might actually go faster if I use nine threads or something like that. But in this case, I'm not waiting on I.O., I'm not doing anything special. If, I'm if I can get the mutexes, I can just go. So in some cases, it might be faster if you add more threads, but if I'm not waiting on I.O. or anything, I'm limited by the amount of actual physical cores I have on my machine. Yeah, so in this case, like I can only do eight things at once and then we're just context switching between threads. So that's just, we're just wasting some time because I can only execute eight at a time anyways. So on some processors, so there's something called like hyper-threading. So like on Intel processors, you might have eight cores and then it says, oh, you have like 16 cores. So some cores will like share some resources and try and make two threads happen on one physical core, depending on the operation. So you might increase your threads to 16 and it might go faster. Maybe eight's faster. It kind of depends on what your application's actually doing. And then that's more of like a performance thing, which you should deal with in 454, although maybe not this. Maybe not. Ideally, you deal with that in 454 because there's no one true answer. It kind of depends. And it depends what the architecture, and then like you throw GPUs into the equation, and then things change too, right? All right, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, if you look at pretty much, if, if you, so one of the things I did in grad school was like I looked at like Linux commits that had the word fix in them and then saw where that code was introduced, like how long in time that was. And yeah, those bugs can be around for like seven years before someone actually fixes them because they're that hard to debug. So like. These are the hardest things to debug, period, because they don't always happen, right? And based off, sometimes you might just never see it, and then you get new hardware, and now you see it. And now, what do you do? So this is like, as hard as programming gets, this is the hardest class of bugs to fix. So, yeah, they're just hard. <laughs> So these are the things that last for years and years and years and years and years. So if you have a bug in your actual program where it's more complicated, this is 
fairly straightforward because every account's independent. But you can imagine kernel code can get quite complicated or some other code might get more complicated, in which case, yeah, you have to start arguing about it very, very thoroughly and it might get really complicated. Yeah? No. No software that can 100% detect. So it will tell you if you have an error, if it sees it. If it doesn't see it, doesn't mean you're safe. And that's like a whole stream of research if you want to get into doing research. The infinite possibilities for that if you want to try and things that, you know, will catch that, da, 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 fun stuff. All right, so we are out of time. So just remember, pulling for you. We're on this together, and this is like as hard as the course gets.